Well, as Pastor Joe said, I'm Sandra Guan, and for this academic year, I'm serving as the interim chair of the Media Arts and Worship Department, your host for Arts Week. Our motto for every Arts Week is beauty at DTS, attending to the glory of God. We want to encourage each member of the DTS family to see ourselves as artists, all of us as artists, and to develop our ability to recognize God's beauty and to express it in a multitude of ways. The theme for this year, the mysterious theme for this year, <laughs> into something rich and strange, is actually a phrase borrowed from William Shakespeare in The Tempest. In its original context, there's a storm and the father of the person addressed has sunk with a ship. In water about 30 feet deep, or five fathoms, his body is transformed as it lies with the coral and the pearls. The spirit Ariel tells the son of the deceased, full fathom five thy father lies, of his bones are coral made. Those pearls, those are pearls that were his eyes, nothing of him doth fade, but doth suffer a sea change into something rich and strange. While Ariel's character is talking about the transformation of the physical body, her words into something rich and strange could just as easily describe those of us who have died and been given new life. We are strangers in a strange land, God's peculiar people, and as we experience a sea change, the more peculiar or strange and yet rich we are becoming. Helping us consider today our restoried lives is Dr. James K.A. Smith. Dr. Smith is known to most of you through his writings as one of his books, Desiring the Kingdom, is required for every student attending DTS and spiritual life, as well as several other courses. He's a professor of philosophy at Calvin College. Trained as a philosopher, Dr. Smith is engaged in public, intellectual, and cultural critic. An award-winning author and widely traveled speaker, he's emerged as a thought leader with a unique gift of translation, building bridges between the academy, the culture, and the church. In addition to authoring numerous influential books, he regularly, regularly writes for such rags as The Wall Street Journal, Christianity Today, New York Times, First Things. He serves as editor-in-chief of Comet Magazine, and recently he was also named editor-in-chief for Image Magazine. He and his wife were elementary school sweethearts. Aww. And they have four children in college. They reside in Grand Rapids. Please join me in welcoming Dr. James K. Smith to Dallas Theological Center. Thank you so much. It's, uh, it's a real treat for me to be here. I, uh, I was saying to others this morning, uh, I, I uh, came to Christ through the Plymouth Brethren uh, and uh, ended up at a tiny little college in Iowa called Emmaus Bible College where all of my professors were Dallas Sem grads. Uh, and what, partly what intrigues me is I've been invited to Dallas Seminary. I've never been invited to Emmaus Bible College. So uh, I'm intrigued by what spirit is afoot here. Uh, so thank you for having me and, and really a, a treat to be part of Arts Week. I, I think this is such an intriguing uh, um, move of the spirit itself. This morning I want to meditate with you on one discomforting uh, insight, and it's this. You might not love what you think. You might not love what you think. This discomforting epiphany sort of bubbled up for me as I was watching a movie by the Russian filmmaker Andrei Tarkovsky, which is probably a sign I need better hobbies, but. <laughs> Tarkovsky's film, Stalker, which is, I, I feel like there's something lost in translation in this title, because it's not as creepy as the title sounds. But Stalker is a fascinating meditation on why you might not love what you think. To picture, I, I'm gonna assume we haven't seen it. So to picture the genre, uh, it, it sort of hovers between noir and sci-fi fantasy. So it's a, it's a really, really funky world that you inhabit in this film. Uh, sometimes it looks like you're watching Cormac McCarthy's The Road, at other times it looks like The Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. It's a crazy, crazy movie. The plot in, and uh, Dramatis Personae is very, very simple. There are basically three characters that matter. The writer, 
the professor, you could see why I was a sucker for this movie, the writer, the professor, and the stalker, who I, for my purposes, let's refer to as the guide. And what's happening in this film is writer and professor have come to stalker, the guide, because he is the one who can lead them to where they want to get to. When we are in the, f the movie, the, there's a lot of sort of mystery and intrigue and we don't know exactly where this drama is taking us. But what we realize is that in fact, writer and professor have come to stalker the guy because he can lead them in this, from this sort of post-apocalyptic wasteland that they inhabit. From that post-apocalyptic wasteland, the stalker is going to lead them to an oasis called the zone. And the place that they want to get to inside the zone is simply called the room, the inner sanctum, the holy of holies. Tarkovsky's not super creative in his labels for things. So you've got writer and professor following stalker so they can get to the zone and eventually get to the room. Why does everybody want to get to the room? Well, because in the room, you achieve your heart's desires. In this room, you will get exactly what you want. Which is why, when they are on the very threshold of the room, and Stalker opens the door, all of a sudden, writer and professor both get cold feet. Why would that be? What's the problem? This is the whole arduous journey and trek and pilgrimage we've made is precisely so you can get to this magical room where you will get exactly what you want. Who doesn't want what they want? Why not step into this room? There's a fantastic little book about this movie. Now you know you really need better hobbies when you're reading books about movies that nobody has seen. <laughs> but it's by Jeff Dyer, who's really one of our great uh, cultural critics, um, and the little book is called Zona. And I want you to hear his encapsulation of this scene because it's perfect. They are in a big, abandoned, derelict, dark, damp room with what looks like the remains of an enormous chemistry set floating in the puddle in the middle, as if the zone resulted from an ill-conceived experiment that went horribly wrong. Off to the right, through a large hole in the wall, is a source of light that they all look towards. For a long while, no one speaks. The air is full of the chirpy, chirpy, cheep, cheep of bird song. It's the opposite of those other places where the sedge has withered from the lake and no birds sing. Here, the birds are whistling and chirping and singing like mad. And Stalker tells the writer and professor, in a way tells us, that we are now at the very threshold of the room. This is the most important moment in your life, he says. Your innermost wish will be made true here. So, here we are. Who wants to go first? Professor and writer hesitate because it dawns on them, what if I don't know what I want? What if I don't want what I think? Well, the room reveals all. What you get is not what you think you want, but what you most deeply wish for. And so now, can you feel this disturbing epiphany creeping up from the, on them? What if I don't want what I think? What if the desires that I'm conscious of, the desires and longings and hopes that I've chosen, so to speak, what if those actually aren't my innermost longings, my deepest wishes? What if in some ways, the deepest longings are humming under the conscious awareness that I live with? What if in effect, I'm not who I think I am? Now, friends, I wonder if many of us can identify with this if we're honest. If I ask you a Christian, a student at Dallas Theological Seminary, if I ask you, what do you want? What do you hope for? What are you longing for? Well, you know the right answer. You know the right answer. And, and by the way, I totally believe you. I, I'm, not, I'm not questioning your sincerity. I know that that's what you believe you want. But would you want to step into that room? 
Are you confident that what you think you love aligns with your innermost longings? This, says Dyer, is one of the lessons of the zone. Sometimes a man doesn't want to do what a man thinks he wants to do. So, okay, how, how could that happen? What would be the explanation for this tension, this gap, this dichotomy, this disjunction between what I believe I want, what I think I want, and what I really want? Tell me what you want, what you really, really want. <laughs> how could it be, how could it be that I don't know what I want? Well, friends, our hearts are inscrutable things, are they not? <laughs> They are this mysterious, conflicted core of who we are. The human heart is an interior depth that eludes us and the prophet Jeremiah says deceives us. St. Augustine puts it differently. He says, my interior life is a foreign country. <laughs> Terra incognito. So you might not love what you think because you're not just a thinker. You might not love what you think because you are shaped by stories that you've absorbed and don't realize it. So what I want us to drill down into this arts week is what I'm gonna call the aesthetics of our assimilation, the aesthetics of our cultural capitulation. Listen, those of us who love to think and learn and teach need to become especially attentive to the hidden unconscious role that stories play in orienting our lives. Many, many evangelicals are what I call intellectualists, which I, I grant will sound somewhat ironic, uh, but what I mean by that is this. They assume to be an intellectualist is to assume that our actions and behaviors and ways of life are the outcomes of conscious deliberation. That's what I mean by intellectualism. It assumes that we are these brains on a stick, that we are these thinking things. And as such, we assume that changing thinking changes behavior. Or conversely, if you're an intellectualist, if you think we sort of think through everything that we then do, you will also imagine that sin is always the fruit of bad thinking and bad ideas. So the intellectualist accounts tend to be very blithely unaware of social forces and systemic factors that prime and shape our imagination that create dispositions in us, tendencies within us towards unjust action and sinful behavior. It's why, it's why intellectualist accounts also tend to be very individualist accounts, as if I'm this island of, of cogitation. And so we might say that an intellectualist model is only able to register something like discrete sinful actions but really can't give us an account of a sinful way of life, the rhythms and habits and routines that disorder a people or a culture in ways that run counter to what God envisions for his creation. But friends, much of our action is not the fruit of conscious deliberation. <laughs> you don't think through everything you do. It's rather so much of our living and being and doing is the outcome of an acquired habitual disposition that we carry in us on a different register. So the same is also true, by the way, of our sinful disordered action. It's why it's the difference between thinking about obedience and sin versus virtue and vice. Vice is different than just sin. Vice is naming the habitual dispositions and orientations that I've acquired that make me lean in a certain direction by default. The quiet, by quiet, unconscious immersion in cultural rhythms and rituals, we are unwittingly scripted into stories that are rival tellings of what's in store for the world we effectively absorb rival eschatologies simply by swimming in the water of the cultural stories that surround us. 
So these narratives and their metaphorical power, narratives aren't really trying to change your mind, they're trying to captivate your imagination. They work on the basis of metaphor and that metaphorical power seeps into our bones in such a way that it comes to really dominate what, what philosophers call the background of our perception. It becomes the sort of uh, 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 background horizon that we bring to everything and now we effectively see the world through those stories. And so it begins to shape the very way that we perceive the world, which then in turn orients and governs our habitual action. So we absorb rival gospels as an unconscious vision of a way of life. And then we act towards them, as it were. We're pulled towards a different vision of the good life that rivals the vision of the kingdom of God. The world keeps painting a picture with allure and we are fascinated and pulled towards it. That is the aesthetics of our assimilation. The world isn't trying to change your mind as much as it's trying to capture your imagination. But since that kind, and since that formation targets your imagination, implanting these stories in us of what the good life looks like, that, door, that deformation now often happens under the radar of our awareness. And it's certainly off the radar of our intellectualist focus. Right? If, all, if all that happens is you are narrowly fixated on the ideas and beliefs and messages of a culture, you will... Uh, that within that narrow bandwidth of cultural analysis, you are gonna completely miss the power of stories and rituals and visions that we are swimming in. So through a vast repertoire of what I call secular liturgies, we are quietly assimilated to what Augustine calls the earthly city of disordered loves. We don't even realize that we're becoming a people who are governed by, Augustine says the earthly city is dominated by two loves, self-love and the libido dominandi, the love of domination, the desire to win. So like the people of Israel that Jeremiah confronts in chapter seven, we toddle off to church or Bible study week after week, comforting ourselves that we're de devoted to the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, and without realizing it, we spend the rest of the week baking bread for the queen of heaven. Because we failed to appreciate the religious nature of these quote unquote secular practices. So we become the kind of people that are inclined to a sort of low grade socially acceptable greed for example that makes us remarkably tolerant of inequality and the exploitation of the poor. Not because anybody convinced us that that was a good position to hold, it's because we've been co-opted into the rhythms of a different story. A way of life becomes habitual for us such that we pursue that way of life, we act in that way of life without thinking about it. <laughs> but it's only because we've absorbed a story that now orients us. Indeed, because such stories become sedimented into my background, it, in some ways, I almost can't see the world otherwise. This is what philosopher Charles Taylor calls a social imaginary. Everybody operates with a social imaginary, and the thing about a social imaginary is you don't know you have it. And yet it filters the way that you perceive everything. I fail then to resist temptation, not because I've simply made a bad decision, but because I have failed to recognize that I'm being misformed by a constellation of cultural disciplines that are disciplining me otherwise. And that rival discipleship is affected through the most banal practices. I, I, I wanna risk our discomfort by, by giving us an example so that we can feel the tension of this. And the example I want us to think through with this lens is racism. Listen, racism is not merely an ideology. Racism is not just a teaching, it's not just a set of beliefs. Racism is absorbed in the scripts of a culture that enact and perform a story about superiority and supremacy, narratives about exclusion and fear, 
and myths of purity and danger. So the reason, the, I want you to see why this makes a difference to frame it in this way. If you tell me you don't believe the ideology of racism, that is almost irrelevant. It's almost irrelevant. I mean, it's not nothing, but here's the thing. You can not believe the ideology of racism on an intellectualist register and still have been completely co-opted at the level of the imagination by the scripts of a racist imaginary. The question is, have you absorbed the story, not do you believe these claims? Have you been caught up in the scripts of this cultural liturgy? Has your imagination been co-opted by a racialized social imaginary without even realizing it, such that now you make your way in the world animated and oriented by a story that is antithetical to the gospel and counter to the narrative arc of scripture, which ends with a choir who sings from every tribe and tongue? And friends, I, I'm, I'm, this, is, this is point at me. It's, it's ridiculous that this white guy is talking about this. But I've also realized that if white guys don't talk about it, a lot of people don't hear about it. And it's partly an unpacking of my own. I realize I've, I have, just by swimming in the water I swim in, I have absorbed a posture towards the world that is antithetical to the gospel. So the depth and tension of this is named very pointedly by theologian Brian Bantam, who teaches at Seattle Pacific University. I want you to hear, indulge me with one quote here, because I want you to hear the, the sort of depth of the tension. Bantam says this, racial identity constitutes a form of discipleship. It's a kind of perverted discipleship that must be theologically accounted for and resisted. The racial performance, do you hear the theatrical term there? The racial performance exists as a social phenomenon and is certainly a challenge to Christian discipleship. But to suggest that it is a religiously grounded form of being in the world is to infer a theological response that must be more precisely in its description of the problem and the way forward. Racial performance is not simply a sinful behavior that must be avoided. It is a way of being in the world that is more difficult to resist for it is the air we breathe. The air is filled with stories. And like what we inhale, we inhale them invisibly. So part of maybe what an invitation of an arts week could be is an invitation to take an audit of the narrative formation of our imaginations. To take an audit, as it were, of what stories we are drinking in that we didn't even realize. Now, here's the constructive turn, I hope. This is exactly why the worship arts are integral to the Christian life. Worship is the Spirit's art of sanctification. Now, I, I feel like I need to pause and just say one little oral footnote here, which is this. When I say the word worship, I don't mean music. Everybody with me? I, I've realized I need to do this in more spaces, because in my tradition, uh, uh, um, uh, I, I can take certain things for granted. But we, we, we I think most of us, uh, especially in North American Protestant uh, evangelicalism, we inhabit now these, these tendencies in which as soon as we hear the word music, we think of the song set that precedes the 50 minute lecture. That's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> so when I hear worship, I kind of, I'm, I'm secretly hoping you'll hear maybe something you've never seen, <laughs> which is the cadences of the people of God gathered around word and table who from the moment of the call to worship until the sending of the benediction that the entire rhythm and repertoire that we are being taken through, the narrative of God reconciling the world to himself, all of that is worship. And that, and that the person acting there is God primarily and not just us. By the way, I heard that Book of Common Prayer prayer this morning. <laughs> That, that's what I'm talking about, the resources and rhythms and repertoires 
of historic, intentional, holistic worship that is, that is narrative in its intentionality because it is refusing and resisting these other cultural stories. It realizes that this is a contest of the imagination. So worship, arts, are integral to the Christian life. Church isn't just the place where the word of God informs our intellects. The church of Jesus Christ is the theater where the grace of God captures our imaginations. Spiritual formation is more aesthetic than didactic. I don't know, I I, I don't know how many more ways I can say that, but uh, uh, um, I'm thinking about a tattoo. Christian formation is more aesthetic than it is didactic. Indeed, all of our didactic fork focus on Bible seems to have done little to prevent evangelical cultural assimilation. Our teaching hasn't prevented our imaginations from being co-opted by rival stories about the good life. And so we need to realize that worship in its totality is the heart of discipleship because in the rhythms of historic intentional worship, the grace of God is weaving us into and weaving into us the story of God in Christ reconciling the world to himself. It takes practice for that story to be caught. And and if we don't recognize this sort of um, contest of the imaginations, what will happen is we will be fixated and, and, and focused on fueling the intellect and not even realize that we are seeding our imaginations to all of these other cultural stories. And so we need to recognize that the spirit is also trying to get hold of our imagination. If I can, uh, um, also because I got slightly more time than I was expecting this morning, so I'm gonna give you some free unplanned stuff. <laughs> Let's just pause here because I don't think I'll get to talk about this tomorrow either. Um, It's also, I hope this reframes what's at stake if the church decides to adopt its repertoires for worship merely from the cultural liturgies in which we find ourselves. In other words, the whole, what what I'm talking about here is worship is the heart of discipleship. Uh, 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 um, worship is the spirit's art of sanctification precisely because it is the incubator for a, a gospeled imagination, which means that it is counterformative to these other rival stories. The, the counterformation happens not just in the content that I'm taking in, but in the scripts and rhythms and narrative that is carried in the form and rhythms of the practices of the people of God. So form matters. And and what happens though, is if in the name of something like relevance, or not being thought weird, or being cool for Jesus, if, if what you think is, well I'm just gonna go and distill sort of gospel content, and, but I'm gonna put it into forms that people are more comfortable with, like a mall, or a coffee shop, or a rock concert, what we don't realize is those liturgical forms, those cultural rituals, are already loaded with a different story, mostly a story of consumption and self-gratification. So you think that you, you you know, in the name of relevance, you think you're sort of redeeming them all, but you end up just commodifying Jesus because people know by the form of the ritual what to expect, which is, oh, this, this person is here to make me happy. Here's, a, here's one more thing on the shelf that I should be able to, and, and uh, can I just tell you as, uh, as an outsider? Uh, well, no, I'll, I'll save it till tomorrow before I leave. I'll, I'll just say this. Uh, we, need, we need to receive the gift of global Christians who come and say, your Christianity's kind of weird. <laughs> You're, uh, you know, you, 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 you need people to come and visit you in Texas and say, hmm, <laughs> interesting. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
we need to, remember, I'm trying to give an account of the aesthetics of our assimilation. And, and it will be particularly malformative if the very site of our counterformation, the body of Christ gathered around word and table, if that very site itself is co-opted by those other cultural narratives and stories. So, let's return to that opening scene from Tarkovsky. Given what you now know about your loves and wants, and the way that we realize that they maybe have been shaped by cultural narratives in ways that we weren't aware of, let's ask the question again. Would you want to step into that room? <laughs> now here, friends, is where we also need to be reminded of the madness of the gospel and the incalculable mercy of God. Christian worship actually faces this reality head on week after week. It recognizes the gap. It names and identifies the gap between what I think I love and what I really love. Between what I say I love and the way I lived out my loves. What still propels us towards rival gods and rival visions of the good life. It's exactly why the people of God are called to regularly confess their sins. Now, again, I don't know where we're all, I, I come out of the continental reform tradition, sort of Dutch Presbyterian, so I don't wanna take for granted a repertoire that might be unfamiliar to you. But I, I, so in case this isn't familiar to you, in historic Christian worship, after having been called into God's presence and, and met and welcomed by a gracious but holy God, the reformers, I'll give you that, okay? The reformers always emphasize that that's exactly why the people of God should immediately engage in the act of confession that God invites them to. So one of the early, so to speak, chapters in this narrative of Christian worship is the humble act of contrition and confession before a holy God. But I also want you to remember, this is not groveling because there would never ever be an act of confession that is not immediately met by the gracious good news of God's assurance of pardon. That God has mercy and has already forgiven you in Christ. But I want you to realize, so that, uh, now I want you to, if you can, uh, think of some of a lot of your experiences uh, in churches and congregations and ask, is that chapter there? Is that chapter of the narrative enacted where we are? And if it's not, what are we losing to lift out that chapter of the worship narrative? What, what opportunity for counterformation and grace is being left out? There's a reason, the reason why the people of God confess, engage in the historic act of confession is not because grandma and grandpa did it or because the fathers did it or because the reformers did it, it's because God invites it as a way to restore a relationship with him over and over and over again and confession takes practice. We, the people of God, are supposed to be the people who are honest about the fact that we don't live up to what we say. We're not holier than that. We're not at church because we're better than people. We're there because we know we're not. And that the grace of God meets us there. There's a beautiful, actually, prayer of confession in the uh, um, earlier version of the Book of Common Prayer that names this tension this way. Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. Why am I not sure I want to step into that room? Because I know I still follow too much the devices and desire of my own heart. But the body of Christ is that unique community of practice that owns up to the fact that we don't always love what we say that we do. The devices and desires of our hearts outstrip even our best intentions. In fact, the practices of Christian worship will be precisely a tangible, practiced, reformative way to address that tension and gap. It's in embodied, intentional, holistic worship that the Spirit restores us 
because he's restoring us. Let's pray together. Gracious God, we rest in the unbelievable grace that you offer to us. You have made us in your image. You, creator, have made us a people who are animated by stories, by beauty, who are captivated by visions, who tune our hearts to sing songs. And we pray by the prophetic act of your word and your spirit that you would unveil for us the ways that we have learned to tap our feet to the wrong drums. That you would unveil for us the places in the hearts where we have been captivated by stories that rival your gospel. And that you will send us, and especially send these students who are bound to your call and will be leading congregations, send us into those spaces curating worship that is tuned to sing your praise. Teach us to sing the songs of Zion and not the songs of Babylon. Work in our hearts, conscript our imaginations, paint a picture of the kingdom of God that is alluring and draws us, and empower your artists who do that in the meantime. For we ask all of these things in the name of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen.